everybody, Dr. T here, Wednesday night. I have literally just come in from hitting my 10,000 steps today in the rain. <laughs> so I am a little sweaty, but I am here and we're gonna do things a little differently tonight. Often I ask everybody to send through some questions and tonight we're going to do it a little different because I'm hoping everyone's going to get on live. Hey there. Oh, everyone's joining. This is great. Um, and we're going to just do some rapid fire Q&A. So if you have a question that you want to ask, then I want you to post it in the comment section. Hey, hey. Awesome. Lovely to see you here. Um, and I'm going to come up with some short, sharp answers, right? So I'm not gonna spend, well, you know me, I like to talk, but I am going to try not to spend too much time laboring over a question, but let's try and get some one sentence answers to some things, or at least one paragraph. <laughs> so if you have a question, uh, let's, let's make sure that it's about reproductive endocrinology and infertility, <laughs> women's health. Let's not make it about stuff I don't know stuff about. Um, so yeah, let's put it in the fertility context. Let's put it in the women's health context. I know on the ABC this week, there was some, um, really passionate and emotional stories around misdiagnosis with PCOS. If there's any questions about that. Hey, here's my first one. Does the rate of rise of HCG in early pregnancy predict outcome at all? Yeah, great question. So is, if it's a suboptimal rise, so if it's less than double in a uh, 48 to 72 hour period, then we have concerns about it not being in the right place. So being an ectopic pregnancy. So you wanna make sure you see that HCG rise by at least double in 48 to 72 hours uh, in the first few weeks. Okay, hello, Maisha. Any other questions? That was a good question. Thanks for answering that, asking that question. Um, okay, so, and the absolute, I'm gonna just continue on until someone else asks a question, but the absolute value is often not important because you can have such a wide ranging HCG in the early stages of pregnancy. Someone could have a 50 at their first measure um, at four weeks, or someone could have a 200, but they're still gonna have viable pregnancy. So, you know, this is where we can't play the, don't play the comparison game, <laughs> don't compare yourself to other people, but it's really how the HCG rises that's important. The other hormone that's really important in that context too is actually progesterone. So we look at the progesterone level as well. And if it's below sort of 20 to 30, it's not a very reassuring sign. Okay, enough about rising HCGs. Any more questions? Come on, there's 25 of you on here. I am sure all of you have good. Here's a question from IVF Bean here. Great tagline. For young people perusing pregnancy, but two miscarriages and one biochemical, would you do some testing? What tests? Oh yeah, I would definitely, I would do tests. Um, I'd be looking at things like what's happening during your ovulatory cycle. So I'd like to track it, particularly in the luteal phase. I'd be looking at the anatomy of your uterus. I would be looking at your chromosomes, your partner's chromosomes. I'd be looking at um, your clotting abnormalities, your endocrine screen. Um, I'd be doing all of those tests. I, I don't actually care that you're under the age of 25. Um, I think that if you have had three pregnancy losses, then you won't at least some baseline investigations. All right, great question. How important is BMI to egg collection? Oh, Chantel Dewar, awfully important. Um, high BMI makes it difficult. So a BMI, and, and, and I've been, you know, looking at the importance of BMI um, in the context of some people carrying more muscle. But if you've got a high BMI and you know it's body fat that, that is what you're carrying, um, then it does matter. It matters in our ability to reach the um, ovaries themselves in the actual egg collection. It makes a difference in how you respond to the stimulation. Um, the thoughts are that you don't respond as well. And it also makes a difference to the actual egg quality as well. So really aiming to get that BMI down, ideally below 35. BMI 35 or, or even better below 30. Um, but even just if you need a number, aiming for about 10% body fat or body weight loss is going to double your chances of success and half your miscarriage rates. Great question, love it. 
Uh, BMI the other way, um, low BMI, it definitely makes a difference with regards to egg quality, but also endometrium. So having a low BMI matters too. So getting that BMI up above 20 is what we're aiming for. Great question. Uh, Style Voya, ooh, good tagline. What's your top tip for health diet supplements when trying to conceive? Do you believe in acupuncture? Yeah, I think acupuncture has a role. Um, unfortunately, the, the big multi-center trials have not shown it to be successful from improving pregnancy rates around the time of an embryo transfer. Um, but there's copious amounts of research showing it's really, really important for helping manage treatment burden and stress. Um, so I think it's important. Supplements when trying to conceive, the number one that is important is folic acid. Like that is the only one that has any evidence to show that if you are taking at least 400 micrograms MCG of folic acid in the month leading into a pregnancy, it's going to significantly reduce your chances of getting a neural tube defect or spina bifida. So that's the only one. Now, would I consider if in an older woman looking at other supplements to help improve air quality? Yes, possibly, but I would wanna to talk to you directly about your specific situation. But the number one across the board, folic acid. All right, is CoQ10 a supplement you recommend? So Katie Sunshine 007. Is CoQ10 a supplement you recommend for people going through IVF? CoQ10 is an antioxidant. It's also part of the electron transport chain, which is in the mitochondria. The mitochondria are like the powerhouse of the egg. They provide with all the energy to make that egg function. And as the egg ages, the mitochondria actually age as well. So there is some evidence to show that including CoQ10 in an aging egg is probably uh, going to be beneficial. Now, it's probably not that beneficial in the egg of a 30 year old, but maybe it's beneficial in the egg of a 40 year old. Again, I would want to have that individualized conversation with someone. Okay, next question. Oh gosh, if I missed any. I love it, guys. Keep them coming. This is awesome. Tamarine, doing ICSI. Does my husband need to ejaculate within five days of egg collection? Is 48 hours. Okay. It, every single clinic has their own policy on this. Um, but you want to make sure that the amount of DNA damage to the sperm is as low as possible. So generally speaking, a, um, a fertility clinic will prescribe um, a, a protocol for ejaculation leading into uh, an ICSI cycle. So speak to your fertility center, but generally speaking, it's every second day. All right. Good question. I'm loving these. This is fantastic. Well done, guys. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. And these are fantastic questions. Oh, here's another one. Um, with 60 AMH of 65, that's a really high AMH. That's more than the 95th centile. In fact, it would be more than the 95th centile, even if you were really, really young. Um, so your question, with an AMH, can I do egg freezing without any injections or gonadotropins? No, you can't. Um, and I would question whether or not you actually need to do egg freezing. Great question, Carmen. I know you and I have been conversing, um, but that's a really high egg count. Um, and if anything, doing controlled ovarian hyperstimulation on someone with such a high AMH, we would put you at risk of developing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation requires injections, injections of gonal F or recombinant FSH or Puragon, whichever company you, um, your, your particular fertility center uses. Um, but yeah, you can't really do it without injections. I'm sorry, but they're little subcut ones. They don't hurt too much. Um, all right, any more questions? This is awesome. Keep them coming through. This is fabulous. Oh my God, I'm tapping into the back regions of my brains to get these answers for you ladies. Are there any gents out there? Any gents got any questions? Have you guys got any questions for your gents? Anything that they've been dying to ask? I'm gonna have a sip, I'm, I'm dying here. Mm. Okay, come on, there's gotta be some more questions coming. Uh, let me think, let me think. What are the sorts of things um, I have been asked today? Hmm. Someone asked me about adenomyosis. Has anyone else out there got adenomyosis? The evidence around adenomyosis and fertility is a little bit vague. There's some evidence to show that adenomyosis that is symptomatic, so painful heavy periods may be associated with infertility, but it's really hard to measure. Um, so we don't really know. A lot of young women, um, oh, Chantelle, did you ask a second question? Let me have a look back. Let me have a look back. You might have to post it again. Let me just scrolling back here. 
scrolling back. Oh, should you be losing weight to get to a normal BMI? Um, well, I suppose it depends on what your BMI actually is um, and what you classify as normal. So average is a BMI of 25. Um, over 30 is considered overweight. Over 35 is considered obese. So um, I, you know what my advice to you would be? My advice to you would be is if your BMI is over 30, just aim for that 10%. So let's say your weight is 100 kilos, just because I'm bad at maths, so it's easy for me to say 100 kilos. Let's say your weight is 100 kilos, why don't you just aim to lose 10 kilos? By losing that 10 kilos, you're going to significantly increase your chances of a pregnancy and reduce your miscarriage rates. Um, some clinics will have a BMI cutoff, they will, um, because they wanna get you the best possible results. And part of the fertility treatment, if you are overweight, Part of fertility treatment is, is optimizing your weight. It, we're only gonna get you a much better result. And your pregnancy is gonna be heaps better as well. So um, I'm hoping that answers that question for you. And if you need help, speak to a, di a dietitian who works in the realms of fertility. They are here in Perth, they are in every state. Um, Google them, come to Wurm, we've got a dietitian who's trained in fertility. Um, who else, who else, who else? Oh, there's some more questions. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I got your second question. Great. Uh, style voyeur, again, good question. Someone told me fishy diet rich in omega-3 really helps. How much does diet matter? Any key no-nos? Okay, my key no-no, don't drink. <laughs> That's my key no-no. We don't know what the lower limit of safety of alcohol is. Um, caffeine, probably one, one coffee a day with two shots in it is good. Um, Omega-3s, hmm, maybe. Like again, it's very hard to do dietary research in the arena of fertility. There is some evidence around the use of omegas and um, suppressing endometriosis. Uh, you may have read about the endometriosis diet. Um, not good quality studies, but uh, there are some people that suggest that taking omegas will reduce the symptoms associated um, because it works in an anti-inflammatory way. Most of that evidence is actually in rodents. Uh, so we don't have great evidence in, um, in humans. But if you're having um, a couple of pieces of salmon a week, so let's say two fishy meals a week, you're probably satisfying all your omega requirements. Um, but but you know, spending lots on additional omega supplements is not thought to significantly uh, improve pregnancy rates. Okay. Oh, Sammy, ask it again, my friend. Oh no, what have I done now? What is your question? You asked yours. Let's see. Sorry, Sammy. Hang on. Let me see if I could. Chantel, you asked about growth hormone for someone below AMH to improve egg quality. The evidence for growth hormone is that it probably doesn't work. Um, have I used growth hormone? Yes, <laughs> I have used it, uh, but in really, really specific situations. Um, but the evidence around growth hormone, pretty big studies has shown that it doesn't really work in women with a poor ovarian response uh, to improve their pregnancy rates. So, uh, it, and it's exorbitantly expensive here in Australia. It's like $200 a day. So no, I wouldn't. Um, okay. Bell Sibley, does omega-3 help with lining? No, it doesn't, Bells. Um, not that we have seen. Um, yes, there's a thought that, and I have said this before in presentations, there's a thought that omega-3s may help, um, but the evidence is not really strong. Um, again, if you're getting a couple of um, omega-rich meals per week, you're probably satisfying uh, the, it, it, all that you need uh, in your diet. Is it true that you have one fallopian tube left, you, your remaining tube will pick up an egg? Yes, there is. There is a study, Haley Bolton. There is a beautiful study that actually shows that in women who ovulate off the ipsilateral, so the same side where they're absent a tube, um, the uh, pregnancy rates um, are still significant. Now, I can't remember the exact number. I wanna say 30%. But um, what it means is if you lose a tube, you, your pregnancy rates are not gonna drop by 50%. They'll drop a little bit, 
but um, they won't substantially decrease. So that's really encouraging for women who have had um, a salpingectomy, say for an ectopic pregnancy. Um, I will still go on and do ovulation induction treatment for them um, because there is still a chance that even if they ovulate from this side, the tube on this side, there's chemo attractants, there's chemicals that attract the um, egg and the tube together. It's amazing. So yes, that is possible. Sammy, I don't know where your question is. Seriously, I keep looking for it. Um, um, I've now answered the growth hormone one, Chantel. Um, how does a low BMI impact implantation pregnancy chances? Yeah, great question. So having a low BMI will actually affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And so um, it can affect ovulatory dysfunction and it can cause a thin endometrium. Not a lot of estrogen around when you've got a really low body mass index and that can affect um, a thin endometrium and also impact on implantation. So Jess, Sammy's gonna jump off in a minute. She's so frustrated. <laughs> can an embryo transfer bring on an earlier period? Can embryo transfer bring on an earlier period? No. In a simple answer and most people who have an embryo transfer will have progesterone support in that embryo transfer which will sustain the uh, endometrium and so it's only when you stop the progesterone support if you're not pregnant after an embryo transfer that the endometrium will shed if you're having spotting through progesterone support after an embryo transfer I'd be having a chat with your fertility specialist about that uh, is transvaginal the only method for egg collection no, it's not, actually. It's the preferred method because the ovaries are so big, they fall down into the pelvis and they're really easy to access. In fact, from the top of the vagina, the vaginal vault in the adnexa where we go and um, pop the probe to where the ovaries sit, it's only about half a centimetre, so it's easy to access. However, some women's ovaries are not falling into the pelvis, probably due to adhesions, and so you can do laparoscopic or transcutaneous um, egg collections but in saying that, the success rates are not as good because what you see with a naked eye is never as good as what you see with an ultrasound. No worry, Bells. Katie Sunshine, do you re recommend genetic testing on all embryos or just for certain situations? What kind of wait time is involved with the testing being done? Okay, there's genetic testing done on embryos for all sorts of different reasons. They're done because um, a couple might have a gene mutation so that's pre-implantation genetic testing for a Mendelian defect, like a gene mutation, something like cystic fibrosis, for example. There are pre-conception, oh, sorry, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or abnormal chromosome number to see if that embryo has an abnormal number of chromosomes, like Down syndrome. Uh, there is also genetic testing for structural uh, rearrangements, such as with a balanced translocation that might be causing recurrent miscarriage. So there's lots of different reasons. Um, the one I think you may be referring to is aneuploidy, uh, abnormal chromosome number. Um, in Western Australia, we actually have a limit. If you're under the age of 35, uh, unless you've had recurrent miscarriage or recurrent implantation failure, you can't access genetic testing or if, you're being, or if it's being done for a PGTM or PGTSR. You can, but if you're just looking at aneuploidy screening, you have to be over 35 or have had a couple of pregnancy losses. Um, so yeah, it is really only for certain situations. I personally probably wouldn't do it in much older women. So say women over the age of, I don't know, random guess, 42, 43. I have my own reasons for that. But um, yeah, in Western Australia, you can't just do PGT on anybody. The wait time involved with testing, well, uh, you take an embryo, you biopsy it, you take the cells out, you then freeze that embryo, those cells are sent to a testing center. And it depends how many other women, or sorry, couples, are having the same thing at the same time as to what your wait time might be. So it might be a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. That'd be an extreme one, I'd say. So mostly you'll get the result back in your month off after having your um, embryos created such that when you wanna do a frozen embryo transfer cycle the following month, Things should be ready to go. But what I normally tell women, expect a three month process. Hope that helps. Oops, I'm not very good at this. Uh, 
Let's see what else, let's see what else. Chantelle, are there differences in embryo transfers when it comes to surrogacy? No, the transfer process is exactly the same. <laughs> Hope that helps. <laughs> Great question. Tamarine, can having lots of protein powder supplements affect male sperm? I would only think it would affect male sperm if they develop renal failure. <laughs> From, from having way too much protein in their diet. That's when it would probably affect sperm function because renal failure is a significant disease process that then causes inflammation, increased free radical damage, which then uh, causes increased um, DNA fragmentation within sperm. Uh, but gosh, they'd have to be having a crap load of protein <laughs> to be actually having that kind of an effect um, on sperm. I'd be thinking about the other sorts of supplements that they're having, actually. You know, stuff that you might buy over the internet that's probably not on the shelves. <laughs> that's the sort of stuff that might affect sperm. No worries, Jess. Oh, I've got to get better at, at, at scrolling. I really do. Okay, who else? Who else has questions? Poor Sammy, she's gone. <laughs> I tried to find your question, Sammy. I, honestly, I scrolled back. Ask it again. Um, McGarry A, fluid in the pelvis post IVF cycle on a scan, is this okay? Oh, could be due to two things. Most likely due to um, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation itself. Having fluid in the pelvis is normal. Could be blood from your egg collection as well. Obviously, when we stick the needle in and suck out the fluid, sometimes we cause that follicle to bleed. So it could even be blood that has collected um, a lot of a lot of fluid in the pelvis is often ascites, um, particularly if you can start to see the uterus and the bowel kind of floating in the fluid, uh, and that can indicate a degree of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, and you'd need to look at all the other um, correlating symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, weight gain, and some of the blood parameters being abnormal as well. But do you know what? I'm going to be honest with you? Every time we stimulate a woman, we, over, we, we hyperstimulate them. I mean, that's what it's called, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Um, so we do kind of overstimulate, and we've got to have that balance between efficacy, getting the numbers that you want, but safety as well, because you can spiral out of control into OHSS really quickly. Okay, Amanda. Oh, gosh, here's me with my terrible scrolling. Amanda Reynolds, I'm 45 and out to do my last cycle of IVF. I've been recommended either a ultra low something something, oh, a low dose, any thoughts? Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to advise your individual situation um, because I don't do that in this, in this um, Q&A. But what I can say is that um, the evidence around different types of stimulation cycles um, is not very robust. I know that's a really vague answer, but um, the evidence between a mini and an ultra low dose and a natural cycle with regards to getting you the outcome that you want, whether it be, um, well, the outcome you want is a live birth, right? So <laughs> the evidence around improving live birth rates, uh, it's just not there with, with really changing up all the different types of cycles. Um, so yeah, I'd maybe go back to your fertility specialist and ask about your specific situation. Sorry, can't really be more specific around your specific situation. All right, come on, Sammy, come on, Sammy. I asked the question, I know I can see you're still here. Ask the question again, please, I'm trying to find it. Shuti Kark, ooh. For low AMH, any supplements or specific foods recommended for a quality uh, and quantity? I can't improve your quantity. Your quantity is what it is, right? It's what you were born with or it's what you have after um, perhaps having surgery or chemotherapy or something that has dropped your egg count. So we cannot improve your quality, quantity, quantity. But, you know, um, improving the quality is a difficult thing. The quality of your eggs is generally commensurate with age. Um, so, you know, beyond the age of 37, we know that the quality really starts to drop off 
We try to improve things with, like we were talking before about coenzyme Q10 or melatonin or, or androgen therapies, but the evidence around these things is not very robust and I would be very specific about the people that I introduce that to. Um, uh, I, I think my feeling is that managing a low AMH is just moving on promptly with either um, preserving your fertility or um, moving forward with creating a family. That, that's how I would manage a low AMH. Okay. Yes, Belle Sibley. Sammy, ask the question again. <laughs> Belle, did you see it? I didn't see the question. I have been watching. Um, Maja Bin Quiresh, can you tell if acupuncture is really helpful while doing IVF? IVF. Um, the studies have been done. The studies, the randomized controlled, double blind, placebo, multi center trials have been done and have shown that, uh, that acupuncture does not improve your chances of pregnancy. It's such a shame um, because I know so many women who find it so beneficial in helping them to manage their cycles. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, test, Justine Proctor. How does an FET cycle differ to an egg collection cycle? Can you overstimulate on a transfer cycle? Oh, what a great question. In some women, I actually do overstimulate them. Oh, Sammy, there's your question. I'm going to come to it. <laughs> um, in some women, I actually do hyperstimulate them um, in, a trans in a transfer cycle so that I get a really decent endometrium because I need bucket loads of estrogen to make their endometrium thick enough and be receptive. Um, but generally speaking, generally speaking, our intention in an FET cycle is just to induce one follicle to produce enough estrogen to give us a nice uh, receptive lining. So, uh, and, and in some women, we actually use HRT, so we don't really stimulate them at all. We just stimulate their uterus to grow a lining. So most situations, no, you don't hyperstimulate. Um, for some reason, it must not be posting my question, but everything else, <laughs> okay. Did you say something rude? <laughs> Have you said something controversial, Sammy? Because I'm, I'm seeing all your, your stuff. Um, maybe post it in the middle of like a conversation that you and I are having and then I'll just read it. Um, okay. How frustrating for you. Chantel, gosh, Chantel, you got all the questions tonight. What would you consider an AMH that is too low? Oh, well, it's age dependent. I'm hoping that someone has shown you the, the nomogram. There's been a study that was done looking at what it, the ranges of um, AMHs at each, each age. And we actually know that they do drop. They do drop, but there's a really wide range at any one age. Um, yours at 1.9, uh, I don't know how old you are, um, but it is, it is low. Now here's the thing, an AMH is not a measure of your fertility. It's not a measure of your fertility. You can have an AMH of 1.9 and go out and have sex with some random stranger and conceive. So it's not a measure of your fertility. It's a measure of how long you've got. So um, hopefully that's helpful to help guide you in what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, Bells, have you got any tips on achieving a good lining? <sighs> Top tips for achieving a good lining. Lots of estrogen. Lots of estrogen that will thicken it up. Um, yeah, management of the thin lining is hard. We generally have a protocol, though again, not robust evidence. Vitamin C, vitamin E, antioxidant therapy thought to help with vasodilation and allow the hormones to get there. High dose estrogen, so orally, topical patch, however you like to get it. Um, Viagra has also been helpful to improve the thickness of the lining because it vasodilates, that's how it works. So it vasodilates. There are some side effects though, some nasal stuffiness and some dizziness, but um, that's how it works. But yes, and then there are experimental treatments, things like um, a GCSF, colony, um, colony G GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which is thought to help improve the thickness, but maybe even the, the methodology of it working is around immunological factors. So it's a hard one, Bells. It's a hard one. Asking about severe viscous sperm. Sperm, maybe that? No, someone else posted the word sperm and it posted just fine. Oh, viscosity in sperm. That's a really hard one. Actually, I've seen viscosity in sperm um, on semen analyses too. 
Um, viscosity is the viscosity of the semen. So you can think that it probably makes it a little bit difficult for the sperm to actually swim out. Uh, and I have looked this, this up before, and the only evidence that I can find around this is, um, well, firstly, making sure it's not all thick because there's lots of inflammatory cells like an infection. Um, but hydration, so the importance of hydrating, um, and possibly even the use of anti-inflammatories. But that is all that I have found. Um, that's for sort of using sperm in a, I, I suppose, for natural conception. Um, after about 20 minutes, the, the, the coagulum starts to really liquefy and the sperm should be able to swim out, maybe with increased viscosity, it takes a little bit longer. But mostly we overcome that when we spin it down um, either for IUI or when we use it for IVF. So it's not really a big issue in assisted reproduction. Ah, I hope that was your question and I hope that I answered it. Um, Louisiana, that's very cool. You treated me with Clomid for my first pregnancy. Cool, which I had my first little babe. Now I'm seven months pregnant. Ah, well done. That's so good. This, you've done something in your lifestyle to improve your ovulation. So congratulations, you. Um, send us through a picture of your beautiful babes. Um, I would love to see that. Um, Guinea girls, is the marina to be embraced for the management of adenomosis and or endo? Or might there be a better treatment that's less invasive? Oh, any hormones, guinea girls. So adenomyosis and endometriosis. Is everyone having fun? Like this is really fun. This is really like off the cuff stuff, isn't it? Um, so adenomyosis and endometriosis are thought to be like cousins. Adeno is the growth of the lining within the wall of the womb. Endometriosis is the growth ectopically, so in the pelvis or elsewhere just not in the lining. Oh, thank you for the love. Um, and so it responds to estrogen stimulation. So anything that's going to protect from estrogen stimulation or stop the estrogen stimulation is going to help manage it. So Marina is one option. The pill is another. Um, progestogen only medications like Visan, like the Marina, the Kylina, um, the Implanon, the Depo-Provera, all of those things uh, will suppress these this disease, these diseases. Um, so yeah, putting a marine IUD in is kind of um, invasive, but there are other less invasive um, options, but they all have side effects. So, you know, talk to, your, talk to your doctor about them and decide which one's for you. But all hormones, all the ones I've mentioned, will suppress these diseases. Sammy, yay! I was just asking if, if it was that bad and we'll be adding to issues of natural conception. Probably not, Sammy, and it's probably not present in every single sample. But if it is, get onto the water, maybe take some anti-inflammatories, see if that helps. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. This is great, guys. Have we hit half an hour? Oh my God, we've gone over. Thank you so much for joining me. I have really had fun tonight. I have a beautiful interview planned for next Wednesday with a gorgeous colleague of mine who works in the arena of PAG, Pediatric Adolescent Gynecology. You will love her. So we've got some great questions for her next week. Um, and if there are any topics that you really want to see addressed on a Wednesday night or anyone you'd like to see interviewed, then please, please, please don't hesitate to come back to me with some comments. Um, I'm always keen to know what you guys want to hear. Um, thank you. Remember, nothing that I said tonight was pertaining specifically to your situation. Most of it was very generic. I would strongly encourage you, if you have not got the answers that you need, see a fertility specialist, see a reproductive endocrinologist, see a GP who specializes in women's health, um, and um, get your questions answered. Empower yourselves with the knowledge and bring your friends back next Wednesday. I'll be here. Have a beautiful week. See ya.